presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Dick Powell and Signa Hasso in To the Ends of the Earth. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. In our play tonight, we take you on a trail of intrigue and suspense that circles the globe. J. Richard Kennedy wrote the story and screenplay of To the Ends of the Earth, and we have the same stars you saw in the Columbia Pictures release, Dick Powell and Sidney Hasso. At one time or another in my travels, I think I have visited most of the fascinating and exotic places of tonight's exciting story. And there's one thing I can assure you, you'll find everywhere. Lux Flakes. Proof enough that Lux Flakes have made a hit, not just with the American housewife, but in Saigon and Singapore and to the ends of the earth. Here's the first act of our play, starring Dick Powell as Mike and Signe Hasso as Anne Grant. United States Department of Treasury. To most of us, that means the place that makes the money. That green stuff we scramble to get and then give back so cheerfully. But the Treasury Department's a lot more than that. It's the Coast Guard, Secret Service, Alcohol Tax Unit, Narcotics. That's where I work, Narcotics. My name, by the way, is Michael Barrows, and I work out of the San Francisco office. And this is the story of how I learned about an innocent, pretty little flower, the poppy. It's not the kind of poppy you've seen. After this one blooms and the petals fall, the pod is ripe. When you bleed that pod and the liquid that oozes out is processed, the finished product is opium. One day before the war, my assistant, Harry Hart, brought in a teletype from my boss in Washington, Commissioner Anslinger. She's at a ship, Mike, a freighter. Been trying to make a landing along the South American coast. Well, what ship? No name or markings. It's being driven north. Been spotted off Peru and Mexico. Might try for a landing around here to refuel or something. Okay, I'll contact the Coast Guard. Just a routine check, but I thought I'd tag along when two days later the Coast Guard spotted the freighter. Must have been hiding in one of the island coves and now was making a run to sea. She was still in our 12-mile limit. If she could get out, she'd be protected by international law. The captain signaled her to stop. She's caught our signal, Burroughs, but she's putting on more speed. Go ahead, Mr. Adams. Fire one over the bow. The shot didn't phase her. We kept on her tail, acting like we meant to board her and see what the bluff would do. She was past the 12-mile limit now. I was alone at the rail, trying to pick up something through the binoculars. Suddenly, I saw a scramble on her deck, the crew and about a hundred men. What happened then was almost impossible to believe. They were pushing those hundred men overboard, men who were chained together, dropping into the sea and disappearing. It was all over in less than a minute. I told the skipper what I'd seen. I asked him to catch up with her, at least let me get a better look. The deck was now empty, just the captain on the bridge. A face I'd never forget. Then we turned back and circled the spot where I'd seen the men go down. And out of the water came the only piece of evidence that said I hadn't dreamed the whole thing. A life preserver. It told me that the ship was the Kira Maru out of Shanghai. Six days later, I was in Shanghai. The office of the Japanese consul. A most uh, shocking story, Mr. Barrows. But unfortunately, we have no record of a Japanese ship named Kira Maru. You don't believe what I've told you. It is strange that you alone should see a hundred men murdered. The killer Maru was too far off. I saw what happened through the binoculars. Your word is good enough, Mr. Barrows. We will take action against the captain of the Kira Maru. So they brought him to trial. He wasn't there to defend himself, of course, and they couldn't be sure that such a man even existed. But they passed sentence. This court, having carefully considered the testimony, finds the defendant guilty and sentences him to a prison term of 30 days. 30 days? In America, that's what you get for reckless driving. Such sentence to be carried out when and if the accused is apprehended. Thank you, Mr. Barrows. That is all. I cabled Ann Slinger that I was licked and coming home. I was in the hotel packing my bag when I had a visitor. A 
Chinese. I saw you in court, Mr. Barrows. I followed your story with great interest. Why? Who are you? One who has always thought that the climate in parts of South America was admirably suited to the growing of the opium puppy. The men you saw murdered were slaves intended for such work. Slaves, huh? You would recognize that captain again if you saw him? I would. Three days ago, a Japanese captain was landed here illegally from a fishing boat. Why would such a man take employment here in Shanghai as a rickshaw runner? Where would I find him? Uh, we'll get to that, Mr. Barrows. These slaves you say you saw, six months ago, in Egypt, a Chinese coolie escaped from a ship called the Kila Maru. Before he died, he gave some information to a British gentleman named Hadley. Look, if you know anything about that captain... This I... also may interest you. The coolie told Mr. Hadley that he was one of 200 slaves brought to Egypt to plant a large field of puppies. Where? For whom he did not know. But he mentioned their name. Hawks. Gene Hawks. The slave said Gene Hawks was a sign, a code. Maybe a man, maybe a woman, maybe an organization. He also said that the harvest of that puppy field would be sent here to Shanghai for refining. This man, Hadley, who is he? The British Narcotics Commissioner in Cairo. Oh, oh, then it's official information. How did you get it? I think this will answer all questions. This cablegram, it arrived at my office, but it's for you. From Washington. Hmm. You are talking to Lam Chi Chao, Chinese Commissioner of Narcotics. You rushed to Shanghai a little impossibly, but you may stay to do yourself some good. And sling it. You see, I, too, had cabled Mr. Ansley. <laughs> Glad to know you, Commissioner. Now, about Egypt. Two hundred slaves plant a poppy field. Six months later, you count one hundred off the California coast. Certain facts begin to come together. Only a hundred would be needed to harvest the crop. The others were loaded back on the Kilomaru for South America. Uh, what's that got to do with the man you were going to help me find? If that rickshaw runner is the captain of the Kilomaru, he's the only link I have between Egypt and the refining of that opium here in Shanghai. Well, why let the stuff get here? Why not round it up in Egypt before it's harvested? The British and Egyptians have been searching for months. And you're expecting raw opium from poppies they can't find to show up here? And very soon. Mm, how do you know? From the poppies grown there legally for medicinal purposes, planted about the same time. In Egypt, the harvest must be completed within five days. Or the pods will rot. A poppy field that no one can find? A story from a dying coolie slave? You expect me to swallow that? I swallowed a hundred slaves going overboard in chains off the California coast. Oh, uh, okay, Commissioner. Now, suppose I see that rickshaw runner. Uh, not until you agree to take orders from me. Oh, I'm sorry. I only work on cases when I believe in them. I will compromise. For just five days, pretend to believe. And follow my orders. After five days, the case is finished, or there is no case. At that time, the Japanese ship captain becomes your private property. Okay, okay. Where do we start? At uh, Sokim Hong, the largest rickshaw station in the city. It is owned by Nicholas Sokim. Let me tell you about it. The next morning, I call on Nicholas Sokim. Here in America, if you want to go somewhere, you call a taxi. In Shanghai, you call a rickshaw. It's big business. I told Mr. Sokim that my name was Brent, and I was in the rug business. That I was looking for a Japanese who recently went to work as a rickshaw. I've gone through all our records, Mr. Brent. And my assistant, Mr. Grieg, has checked every man we employ. We have no Japanese working here. Oh, thanks, Sokim. You've been very cooperative. I won't stop looking. If I find anything, I'll call you at hotel. I was about to leave when a young woman walked up, good-looking, well-dressed. Holding on to her hand was a Chinese girl. I, uh, I beg your pardon. I've been looking for Mr. Shannon. Shannon? Uh, Shannon's World Tour? Yes, I understood they would start from here. Mr. Grieg? Yes, sir. Shannon's World Tours. Have I been here for rickshaws today? They're scheduled for tomorrow morning, sir. Oh, I see. Well, thank you very much. Come, Chopin. Come along, dear. I walked back to the hotel, and so did they. But it was so Kim I was thinking about. I was sure I'd never hear from him again. I was in my room trying to figure the next move when the phone rang. Hello? This is so Kim. The man you want to live is in a rooming house, number 17, Berry Ave. What's his name? He goes by the name of Sego. I'm afraid that's all I can do. Thanks. I waited for over an hour in Berry Alley. Then I saw him come out. The man I'd come 6,000 miles to find. 
Captain Safe. It was easy following him. He led me straight back to my own hotel, to the desk clerk. Uh, Mr. Shannon is expecting me of the Shannon World Tours. What is his room number, please? 506, sir. Elevator to the left. Shannon World Tours. This morning, it was the good-looking girl who had mentioned Shannon World Tours in front of So King's. Yes, sir. Oh, I, uh, I was just wondering if any American tours happened to be in town. Oh, yes, sir. Shannon's World Tours. Hmm. What's his schedule? Uh, here's one of his folders, sir. It's on here. Big car? No, rather small. Seven or eight Americans, sir. Ten minutes later, I tailed Captain Sago back to 17 Berry Alley, itching to lay my hands on this murderer. But he wasn't my private property yet, not for four more days. Back in Lum's office, we looked for Shannon's pedigree in the narcotics code book. It was Lum who spotted him. Here's your man, Mr. Barrows. A little younger than the photograph in the cover folder, but here he is. Ah, only here, he's, he's listed as Shea. Shea instead of Shannon. Hmm. What's it say about him? World travels, huh? A dodge to make narcotic smuggling easier. Tomorrow morning, join that party of tourists for the day. Memorize their faces. Well, there's one I have memorized. The good-looking girl who came to Sokim's this morning. Let's hope she'll be there tomorrow morning, too. A pleasant day's work ahead, a tour of Shanghai, a chat with my American companions as we drove along in time to study every face. There was a stop at the Willow Pattern Tea House for refreshments. My first real chance at those two I'd seen yesterday looking for Shannon, the girl and her young Chinese companion. Well, it's uh, rather crowded in here, isn't it? What? Uh, oh, oh yes. Yes, it is. Oh, oh do you mind those, those, those flowers? Isn't that a rosa genensis? You see, I go in for roses. Now, my name's Brent. I travel for a rug firm. How do you do? Your little friend here, she seems so unhappy. I hope she isn't ill. She'll pass speaks English. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. But it's quite all right. You see, the Japanese bombed and captured Chupin's village. They took, they took her family away, and it happened only a few weeks ago. Oh, I, I see. Chupin, huh? Well, now, that's a nice name. I, I think I'll just call you Princess. I didn't get your name. Well, her name is Mrs. Anne Grant. Oh. Well, it's a nice tour, isn't it, Mrs. Grant? You're going all the way to the States, Princess? Yes, to San Francisco. Well, what do you know? That's my hometown. I think you're both very lucky to be going there. Oh, Mrs. Grant isn't going. Oh? You're staying in China? Yes. Uh, yes, I am. Uh, Chopin, come along, dear. I promised Miss Harrison that you... The well-known brush-off. Interesting and a little mysterious, this Mrs. Grant. And exactly why was she staying in China? Well, what little I learned went into my pocket notebook. I couldn't risk remembering every minor detail, and minor details might prove very important. Our last stop for the day was at the temple, and when we came out, it didn't seem too unusual that the wheel of my rickshaw should break down, or that Shannon himself should offer to walk me back to the hotel. Uh, tell me, Mr. Brand, didn't you lose something this afternoon? Uh, this is yours, isn't it, this notebook? Oh, yes. Yes, it is. Um, what did you say your business is? Oriental rug. Hmm. Strange you'd make these notes about my guests. Uh, or are you really a census taker? I have no idea. Let's get back to the street, huh? Oh, we'll save a lot of time down this alley. Now, what did you want those names for? Talk fast, mister. Who are you? Now, before you get tough, Mr. Shea, listen. You've been caught before. This time you'll do five years unless you talk. About what? A ship named the Kiramaru. I don't know what you're talking about, but I know who you are, and I'm not going to let you pin a five-year stretch on me. <laughs> they appeared out of nowhere. Eight or four. Jay's little helpers. When I came to, I was lying on a dock at the waterfront. It was almost dark. Bending over me was so King's assistant, Mr. Green. You'll be all right, Mr. Brent. Oh, Great. You're a very lucky man. Mr. Sokim had a hunch this might happen. Well, what did happen? Shannon was going to kill you. I followed him here. When he resisted, well... Shannon's dead? Yes. He was wearing this belt. It's unrefined opium. Mr. Sokim knew he had it somewhere. How? He called on Mr. Sokim before your tour started. Mr. Sakim told him he had no interest in smuggling narcotics. Then what? Well, Shannon said this shipment was perfectly safe. Straight off a Japanese boat. Did he say where it was grown? 
I believe he mentioned Egypt. Where in Egypt? Oh, I don't know, sir. I have an automobile, Mr. Brent. Perhaps I'd better take you to your hotel. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to stop at a friend's first. Uh, Mr. Lum, 25 Peacock Lane. Perhaps I'd better wait for you in the car, Mr. Brent. No, I'd like you to meet Mr. Lum. And you can start telling me the truth. All right. I don't understand. Well, maybe this will help you understand. Mr. Farrows. Hello, Lum. You better give me a hand. All right, Greg. Now get up and go in. No, sir. I had a very interesting tour, Lum. So I could see. You hit me. Why? Why? Yes, Mr. Farrows. Why? Well, listen to this. I tangled with Shannon this afternoon. It was not cold. Woke up miles away on the river. Shannon's dead. At least Mr. Grieg says so, and that much I believe. Mr. Grieg, under Sokeem's orders, saved my life. Mr. Sokeem did more. Here, take a look at this. Raw opium. Grieg says he found it on Shannon. Opium from the Kiramaru from Egypt. That's what Shannon said. You heard him say it? Well, did you? Yes. You're a liar. The opium couldn't have been from Egypt because poppies can't be harvested until the petals fall, and they fall this week, today, maybe. The opium we're looking for is still in Egypt. Shannon got that from the Japanese captain. He got nothing from the Japanese captain. So King told the captain to lead me to the hotel yesterday. I was supposed to hear him say, Mr. Shannon's room, please. That was to throw me off, to pen suspicion on Shannon. And then Mr. Sokeem saves my life. Throws me some narcotics that could have been Shannon's or anybody's. Then you think Mr. Sokeem is interested in narcotics? He's got to be. And ten to one, that refining equipment you're looking for is somewhere in Sokeem's rickshaw station. I'll phone the police. They can pick up Mr. Grieg, arrest Captain Sago, and later we'll raid Sokeem's train. Later? Why not now? Because first I want to know more of what happened today. This way, Mr. Grieg. Well, that's about it, Lum. Here. Here are the names of everyone in the party. It will be well to question them all. Except Mrs. Grant. Why not? Well, I told you that Shannon's tour is leaving Shanghai, but Mrs. Grant is staying. That means she couldn't be tied up with him. But she could be tied up with Sokim, waiting the arrival of the opium from Egypt. Then if she's half as smart as you think she is, she won't talk. You'll get nothing out of her. But I think I can, through the Chinese girl. Good. Now, about Sokim's place. You ready to raid it? Yes, now I am ready. While that's going on, have the police pick up Mrs. Grant. Be sure they leave Chupin in the hotel. You are not coming with me on the way? No, I think I'll learn more in the hotel with Chupin. Before we bring your act two um, to the ends of the earth... Here's Libby Collins, our Hollywood fashion reporter. You know, John, girls who are going to college this fall, or who are in college now, will get a lot of good ideas from Jean Peters' wardrobe, and it happens every spring. And will chemistry professors get ideas about becoming baseball players like Ray Milan? <laughs> <laughs> well, better get Jean's opinion on that. She was a co-ed herself not so long ago. Incidentally, she's just left for St. Louis with other stars from the studio for the picture's premiere on the 26th. She plays the daughter of the president of the university. So 20th Century Fox made a careful check of what the well-dressed co-eds are wearing before designing Jean's costumes. Her wardrobe for It Happens Every Spring includes lots of lovely blouses for her suits and, of course, separate sweaters and skirts. Hmm, sounds like a luxable wardrobe. It is, and so true to college life. Lux flakes are as popular on college campuses as they are in Hollywood studios. That's easy to understand. These tiny diamonds of Lux whip into suds fast. And what girl isn't always in a hurry? The suds are wonderfully thick and rich, too. So much college washing is done in the bathroom basin, girls appreciate the way Lux flakes float away soil with gentle squeezing. Besides, allowances can't stand expensive cleaning bills. So Lux flakes are the rule for everything safe in water alone. Blouses, sweaters, nice cottons, and washable prints. An easy way for any woman to keep things fresh and attractive, especially in warm weather. Lux Flakes are another fine product of Lever Brothers Company. With Lux Flakes Care, you can freshen things in no time. And your favorite washables stay lovely far longer. 
Now, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Act two of To the Ends of the Earth, starring Dick Powell as Mike and Sidney Hasso as Anne Grant. And so while Lum and the police were raiding Sokeem's rickshaw station and Mrs. Grant was being held at headquarters for questioning, I went to her room to the hotel. A Chinese girl from Pan opened the door. Oh, Mr. Grant. Well, hello, Princess. Is Mrs. Grant in? Well, she went out. She was very upset. The tour is not sailing to America. Yes, I heard about that. I, I thought I could help you get to San Francisco some other way. I... Oh, I bet you've known Mrs. Grant a long time, huh? Only a year, Mr. Brent. She was my governess back home in Panyin after her husband died. Oh, that's too bad. I suppose Mr. Grant was a teacher or a missionary? An engineer. They were married in America. Mrs. Grant used to tell me all well, about... Good evening. Oh, hello, Mrs. Grant. I was just talking... Oh, Chopin, to... I'm sorry, dear, but I forgot to stop in the lobby. Will you see if there's any mail, please? Yes, of course. Thank you, dear. And now, Mr. Brent, what are you doing here? Weren't you called at the police station about Shannon? Why, yes. They sent me back here to get my papers. Well, I, I knew Chupin was alone. I thought I could cheer her up a little. Strange kid. She can't be more than 13 or 14. Yet time... I, I know. At times, she looks much older. Yes, that's what death and bonds will do to a child. Suppose I could help you, Mrs. Grant. How about two tickets on the clipper? Oh, it's very kind of you, but I'm not going to America. You want to stay in China? Yes, I do. Well, I, uh, I guess you have your reasons. The children of this country have a right to live. You're kind of young to bury yourself in Pan Yen. What else did Shu Pan tell you, Mr. Brent? Something about my husband, perhaps? Mm, she mentioned him, yes. He was killed by Japanese bombs while doing a job for China. I intend to finish that job as best I can. Why not go back home and tell Americans about China? Raise barrels of money for thousands of Shu Pans. Or... Uh... Maybe there's something else. You don't want to talk about it. What makes you think so? Because if Chupin means to you what you say she does... After a point, she doesn't. And the sooner she realizes... I'll take it. Hello? It's rather important that you come to Sokeem's, Mr. Brent. That is, if you're finished... I'll be right over. Oh, uh, that was those people who sent for you, Mrs. Grant. And while I'm there, I'll try to make some arrangements. I'm sure everything's going to be all right. Thank you. <laughs> We'd made a good guess about So Keen. Upstairs, over the shed where the rickshaw drivers lived, was equipment enough to refine half the opium in Asia. Only Mr. So Kim wasn't there to tell us about it. He'd swallowed poison. Mr. So Kim was dead. So, actually, we have learned very little, Mr. Barrows. He died before I could question him. Oh, we should never have moved in on him. We should have waited until the opium from Egypt had arrived. Once you knocked Mr. Big down, there was little else we could do. Yeah, yeah I know. I, I made a bad mistake. Oh, in my time, I made a few myself. So Kim was afraid. Afraid of what? Mr. Barrows, for years, there's been an organization in China operating in drugs, backed by the Japanese high command. Why? Because drugs eat away a people's will to resist, and conquest becomes easy. And the brains of this organization? Citizens of all nations. The radical Sokims who believe in conquest. The degenerates who can be bought to do this filthy work for the Japanese high command. But let someone fail. Sokim failed. Suicide. Sokim's death will warn the others. That raw opium will never come here now. I am sending Sokim's papers to Cairo immediately. A bare possibility they will yet find the puppy field. It is my hope that you will take them. Oh, I'm sorry, Lum. I know it was my blunder that finished the case here, but it is finished. What about Mrs. Grant? For a year and a half before coming to China, she was in Egypt. The visas and dates on her passport leave no doubt of it. Look, look, now, any decision on my going to Egypt would have to be made by my boss. Mr. Anslinger and I have exchanged several messages. Oh. He's quite willing that you should call. <laughs> One step ahead of me right down the line. Excuse me. Yes? This is Captain Singh. We have just released Mrs. Grant. Thank you. She wishes to leave at once for San Francisco with Sue Pan. Uh, one moment, please. Mrs. Grant wishes to go to San Francisco. She told you that? She told me she was staying in China. Well? Let her go. Our men there can watch her the moment she lands. We think she should go, Captain. I was 
met in Cairo by the Egyptian and British Narcotics Commissioners, Amma Hassam and Lionel Hadley. Hassam went to work on Sokim's papers while Hadley broke the unhappy news that this was the last day of the poppy harvest. All he was sure of was the route the opium would take when it left Egypt. Take a look at the map, Mr. Barrows. We know the poppy field is somewhere in this area. If so, the only logical way out of Egypt with the raw opium would be across the Suez Canal. And the nearest crossing of the canal is here. Mm. And if all the harvest hasn't been moved, what's left will go tonight. I'm afraid so. Did you check on Mrs. Grant? Yes, she and her husband left Cairo ten months ago. No record of where they went. Well, I've examined Sokim's papers. One lonely clue, gentlemen, this letter. Uh, not the contents, but the handwriting. What about it, Hassan? It's written in English. But the men who wrote this letter first learned to write in Arabic. There are certain characteristics. I examined the paper itself. Made in France. French paper isn't sold in Egypt. But it is sold in the French mandate, such as Lebanon. But I thought the party field was in Egypt. Where does Lebanon come in? Lebanites. We have many wealthy Lebanites with estates in Egypt, especially in the suspected area. Suppose we run the film again. Why not? We have motion pictures of some of the Lebanon estates, Mr. Barrows. Let's look them over. Uh, this is the last reel, Mr. Burroughs. The estate you're looking at now belongs to Ali Yusuf. Ten acres of roses grown for perfume. Hmm. What kind of roses? They don't look like much from the air. Rosa Sancta, probably. You're Rose Sancta? Oh, I certainly am. I'd like to get a cutting of that Rosa Sancta to take home with me. Uh, this next estate belongs to Jaffa Pasha. Maize and cotton, easily identified. And now, we move to the uplands. Uplands? How do they get the water? Piped over from the Nile. Drawn up by pumps. That's a bit of engineering. And now this estate is at the edge of the Bayadea Plateau, the property of Bindashar. Thirty acres of roses for perfume. Artificial irrigation, huh? A very modern job was done up there about two years ago. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't remember that engineer's name. <laughs> I'm afraid not. Cheer up, Barrows. Perhaps what we all need is a drink. Uh, how far is it to this Bendishar's place? Oh, three hours back, huh? I'd like to have a specimen of that rose. Bendishar would never let you go near the place. It's strictly against Muslim law. That's why we had the photograph in the air. Why couldn't I climb one of those cliffs? You're not serious. Why not? Well, even if you didn't break your neck climbing, Bindershaw would break it for you when you got to the top. Oh, it'd be dark by the time I got there. Mind if I borrow your car? Nothing could prevent Hadley and Hassan from coming with me. They knew it was more than a rose I was after. And these were the last desperate minutes of the last day. They were ready to follow even this wild hunch of mine that the irrigation system at Ben Deshaw's had been installed by an engineer named Grant. It was a clear night, and once at the top of the cliff, we saw the almost endless line of roses. We're getting too close to the house. There may be dogs. We'd better leave. We found exactly nothing. What did you expect to find? I don't really know. But an engineer doesn't come all the way from the United States just to install a few pumps for growing roses. Unless... Hey, oh, wait a minute. Alice, where are you going? I had to take a look at that irrigated soil. It had just been cultivated, too. My hunch was leaping around like mad now. And then all of a sudden, the almost unbelievable answer. There in the earth, almost covered, a battered stem that had been hoed under just a little while ago. Not a rose stem, but a stubby one with a swollen pod at the end. Stem of the opium poppy. Poppy stems, planted, grown, and harvested under the rose bushes. No wonder we couldn't detect anything from the air. Well, now we know how the opium might be going through. And perfume jars, cartons of rose petals. I should be at the Suez Crossing telling my men what to look for. Suppose the last of the harvest is still here? Take the car, Hassan. Get to the crossing. What about you? I'll keep looking here. I'll stay with you. I'll be at the crossing in uh, 30 minutes. I'll send some men back to watch for you. Here, take my gun. Thanks. Well, let's go, Barrows. We finally found what we were looking for. A barn that held the entire secret. In it, stupefied with opium, were what remained of the 200 slaves brought to Egypt six months before on the Kira Maru. Also in the barn were the vats where the gummy juice of the poppy plant had been turned into raw opium. May I ask what you are doing here? Binder Shah. Yes. We've been learning about the harvest of the opium poppy. Your knowledge comes late. The harvest left here an hour ago. I did not come alone, gentlemen. I am well protected. We didn't come alone either. 
Your entire estate is surrounded. The best thing you can do is to tell us where the opium is going. I have completely forgotten. Order your men to put down their guns. Hop, Topka, Alaladi. The men lowered their guns and disappeared. It seemed incredible that Ben Shah should surrender so readily. We ordered him ahead of us and walked back toward the cliff. Suddenly he started running straight for the cliff and over it. A second fanatic like So Kim, paying with his life for faith and taking all information with him. By midnight, we were at the Suez crossing, only there wasn't a sign of the opium. At dawn, Hassam's men came back from Ben Shah's, where they'd searched the estate. Ben Shah's private papers yielded nothing, but out of the pump house came an interesting item, an engineer's logbook. In the book was a snapshot. Well, who is she, Barrows? You seem to recognize her. Ah, oh, oh, Mrs. Grant. Hmm. This logbook belonged to her husband. At... Hey, wait. Barrows! Hassam? It sounds exciting. The opium scar. That's not news, Hassam. But I think I know where it is. Now, who has left this crossing tonight? According to the customs men, no one's left here since 6 o'clock yesterday afternoon. What about that camel driver I told you about? But you said his camels weren't carrying anything. No, nothing on their backs. One native driver, ten camels. Headed for Beirut, you said. A camel driver said the price of camel hair and hides has just gone up. He's taking them to a slaughterhouse. Then what makes you think... I just telephoned Beirut. Actually, the price of camel hair and hides had gone down. The driver was lying. It is my opinion that the opium is inside the camels, forced down their throats in some sort of containers that will be removed at the slaughterhouse in Beirut. Fantastic. Any more fantastic than poppy plants growing under roses? I suggest we get to Beirut, gentlemen, and wait for the camels. Hadley put a couple of men on the trail of the camel driver. We took over again near the outskirts of Beirut. But this was French territory, and helping us now was Emile Orissier, the French narcotics chief. It is vital, monsieur, that the camel driver never know what that we suspect. How can we examine his camels without his knowing? He will find hundreds of camels at the edge of the city, and men from the Department of Sanitation checking the beasts against disease. His ten camels along with all the others. What he will not know is that only his camels will be fluoroscoped. He'll get suspicious. Undoubtedly. As a result, there will be no delay at the slaughterhouse. Now, I suggest you wait at the hotel. I will have the information you need sometime this afternoon. Well, monsieur, I can now report. In the stomach of each camel were many metal cartridges. You may be sure they contained the opium grown on Binder Shah's estate. An estimated $100,000 worth in each piece. A million dollars all told. Where were the camels taken? To a slaughterhouse owned by a man named Agassiz. Forty minutes ago, a truck left the slaughterhouse for the docks. It carried three bales for shipment. Then let's get to the docks. We've got to know their destination. One of my men already has that information. The first bale went to a Mediterranean freighter addressed to Monsieur El Lexato, Athens, Greece. Greece. The second will go about a French ship bound for Marseille and someone named Dolier. The other bale went to a Dutch freighter addressed to N. Vranstata, Havana, Cuba. We can be fairly sure, Monsieur, that a million dollars worth of opium is in one of those bales. That night at dinner, we celebrated the first solid clue that might take us eventually to the leader of Jean Hawk's ring. That woman, Monsieur Bell, the one in Shanghai. You told me before you would show me your photograph. Oh, yes. Here you are, Lorissier. We found it in Grant's logbook. Ah, yes. Yes. Very beautiful. Mm, intelligent, too. Knew there were poppies growing at Ben Bashar's. Much too intelligent to mention it. And she is still in Shanghai? No, 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 she's not. Oh, uh, by the way, Lorisier, that, that man you're sending to Havana tomorrow, mm-hmm. that's on my way home. I'd like to follow that bail myself. Another hunch, Barrows? No, Hadley, this time it's information. Oh. I had a cable today from my office in San Francisco. Here, read it. Anne Grant left San Francisco a few hours after arrival. Destination, Havana, Cuba. Pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Ah, 
after a brief intermission, we'll continue with Act Three of To the Ends of the Earth. Our special guest tonight is beautiful Lola Albright. Lola has just been handed a new contract with Columbia Pictures. I'm so thrilled, Mr. Keeley, I can hardly believe it. You know, they tell me at Columbia, you've been a very apt pupil. Well, yes, I did study hard. But what I appreciated most was the opportunity of going on sets. That's how I happened to see that terrific earthquake scene for Lust for Gold. And I certainly was impressed. Really a great picture. You know, Glenn Ford does a remarkable job with an unusual characterization. There's something really different what he's done here to four on the screen. And I loved Ida Lupino in the lovely costumes of the 80s. And what a sizzling performance. And <laughs> all those period costumes for Lust for Gold, they must have given the wardrobe people a headache when they were on location in Arizona. The wardrobe mistress mentioned that, but uh, John Kennedy will be interested to know that the company took along plenty of Lux plates. Miss Lupino's embroidered stockings, as well as her own nylon, survived beautifully. A matter of dollars and cents economy, Lola. I can believe that. My own nylons are washed with Lux flakes, and they last for ages. You may not realize it, but that simple care is giving you twice the wear. If you were to use strong soaps or rub nylons with cake soap, they would go into runs a lot sooner. Strain tests prove that. To lux them is certainly easy. Just about the easiest care in the world. These tiny diamonds burst into suds the instant water touches them. And in no time at all, these thick, rich suds make stockings fresh and trim-fitting as ever. Help protect the colors, too. Thank you for coming tonight, Lola Albright. Here's your producer, Mr. William Keeley. The curtain rises on the third act of To the Ends of the Earth, starring Dick Powell as Mike and Senior Hessel as Anne Grant. I was sure that the bale containing the opium was the bale being shipped to Cuba. Or, why was Mrs. Grant going there? That's what I told the narcotics commissioner in Havana, Alberto Barado. It should not be difficult, Senor Barros. I will let you know where she is, what she does, and whom she sees. Oh, uh, one person she will be seeing, I think, is a fellow named Brandstatter. Know him? A manufacturer of Arctic supplies, I believe. Brushes, things like that. Getting the camel hair for his brushes from the Near East. Only this shipment contains a million dollars worth of unrefined opium. Well, let him refine it. Let him ship it out with his artist supplies. And then? Then I follow it. A million dollars worth of narcotics, and all I do is help to see that it gets safely away? A lot to ask, huh? Yes, senor. A lot to ask. Berardo worked fast. Before evening, he told me that Anne Grant had reached Havana with Chupin. Two days later, the Dutch freighter arrived, and the bale of camel's hair was now in Brandstatter's possession. That night in my room... Yes? Berardo. Well, they've just booked passage. Ranchstatter, Mrs. Grant, and Chupin. The steamship Cardillo for New York. The Cardillo? Well, there's no ship in port called the Cardillo. She docks here tomorrow, senor. Sails at noon the following day. I will have a report soon on every piece of freight she is taking aboard. Good. See you here in the morning. For 24 hours without pause, Berardo and his men checked and rechecked the cargo of the Cardillo. Absolutely nothing was being shipped by Branstetter. Not a ray of hope until three hours before sailing time. And then some last-minute cargo arrived on the dock. Artist supplies from N. Vanstatter, addressed to a man named Sharp, Maiden Lane, New York. A ray of hope that made no sense. There wasn't a chance the opium was in those boxes. The most routine checkup in the New York Customs would reveal it. It was too late now to do anything but let Branstatter get the opium on board his own way and take our chances of finding it. But right then, a couple of worried men got lucky. One of Berardo's lookouts on the dock came up to report a very ordinary incident. The truck which had delivered the boxes of artist supplies had stalled on the wharf. But the lookout at Nando had been curious. And while one of the men worked on the motor, a second one was tearing the wrappings of some packages in the back of the truck. Where did it stall at Nando? Near the kitchen supplies being loaded on the ship, senor. Cartons of butter. And when the wrappings came off Brandstatter's packages, that's what they were. Three cartons of butter exactly like the others. Now we were getting somewhere. Three cartons of butter containing a million dollars worth of opium were stored in the ship's refrigerator, where one of Randstad's men, a member of the kitchen crew, could watch it carefully. An hour before sailing time, we saw them go aboard. Mrs. Grant, Chupin, and Brandstatter. 
According to plan, there would be a vacant cabin for me on sea deck, and waiting for me, now posing as a ship's steward, was Hernando. Do not worry, senor. That refrigerator will be watched constantly from here to New York. And how? By whom? During nights, by the baker, an old friend of mine. During the day, the ship's butcher and the assistant chef. Uh, where, where's Branstadter's cabin and the others? On the upper deck, senor. B deck. Before dinner, Hernando had news for me. Branstadter is no longer on B deck, senor. He complained about his cabin. He's taken the one right across the corridor from you. Then he knows I'm here. No, I don't think so. He inquired about all the cabins. I merely told him this one was vacant. I think he believed me. He's at dinner now, and I'm moving his luggage. Empty cabins aboard the ship don't have locked doors. My door was locked. Sooner or later, Branstadter would have to know why. Sooner or later, he'd... I beg your pardon. How stupid of me. Yes? They gave me the wrong key. I simply went to the number like a sheep. I'm very sorry. Uh, I don't believe we have met. I uh, came aboard ill. Oh, I'm very sorry to hear it. Please forgive me. Score for Branstetter. He'd never stop now until he knew exactly who I was. A good chance I was a narcotics agent. An outside chance I'd been on his trail since China. A million to one shot, Mrs. Grant had seen me there, would know who I was. He'd have to bring Mrs. Grant to see me. But no move by Branstadter until the following evening. You were off Cape Harris, just 24 hours out of New York. I could hear the ship's orchestra and the passengers, all very gay and friendly. What more perfect time for a man of finesse to visit a poor shut-in. And that's just what happened. Come in. Good evening. Uh, we have brought you a little cheer from the captain's table. Oh, and may I present... Hello, Mrs. Grant. You know each other? Why, yes. Mr. Grant and I... What a charming coincidence. We met in Shanghai, Mr. Uh... Grant, Shatter. You seem to be feeling much better tonight. Uh, much better, yes. I'll be up and around tomorrow. Good. Well, I really should be going back to the party. Oh, why don't you stay a while, Mrs. Grant? I'm sure you will have a lot to talk about. <laughs> I'm sorry you've been ill. No, just a touch of fever. I picked it up in Egypt. I thought you went to San Francisco. I did. But you see, Chopin's uncle, Mr. Sue, had gone to our van on business. He insisted that we meet him there. And this Branstetter, a ship's acquaintance? Yes, a business friend of Mr. Sue. He's been very kind to us. Oh, see. Charming fellow. You're looking very well, Mrs. Grant. Oh, thank you. I feel wonderful. Mr. Brent, remember the things you said to me in Shanghai? I mean, about coming back to the States. I know now how right you were. Oh, well, good. Fine. Well, I don't want to keep you from the party. You sure you can't join us? Tomorrow. We'll have a big day tomorrow. All right. Good night, Mr. Brent. In the morning, I joined Mrs. Grant and the others, a happy, chatty little group, inseparable by lunchtime. Chupan gave me a little pencil sketch of herself that one of the passengers had made. The artist said there were lines of suffering in her face. Mid-afternoon, less than an hour from New York. But nothing was worrying Nicholas Branstadter or Anne Grant. I couldn't understand it. What if Branstadter had known who I was long before I got to Havana and had set me on this false trail while he got the narcotics on board some other way? This panic of mine was growing every minute. We were at the bar now, having a drink. Someone said we'd be taken on the harbor pilot soon. Maybe I'd better take Chopin's baggage. Oh, not yet, Mrs. Grant. We have plenty of time. Another drink, Mr. Brent, to our continued friendship. Then suddenly there was a commotion astern, a flurry of excited voices and a faint odor of something burning. There's nothing to worry about, ladies and gentlemen. If you smell smoke, there's a little freeze fire in the galley. Mrs. Grant... It's all right. It's all right, dear. You heard what the officer said. Incidentally, Mr. Brent, why don't we all have dinner tonight on shore? Oh, could you, Mr. Brent? Uh, yes, Princess, I think I could. But uh, we'll be docking soon. I have a lot of things to do. And I'd better start my pack. Maybe Chupin would like to watch the seagulls. See, they are just off the stern, hundreds of them. But what are they doing? <laughs> Having dinner, my dear. The crew is throwing refuse food overboard. Come, let us go and watch. Oh, please, Mrs. Grant. Oh, well, Chupin. All right, for a moment, maybe. I rushed to find Hernando, that's far in the galley. 
Hernando's words confirmed what I was dreading. The cartons are empty, senor. Empty during the fire. Well, where did the stuff go? What about our men down there? Well, there was so much smoke they could not see. Go back to the galley, Hernando. I'll see what our friends are up to. I went out on deck. I remember passing a lifeboat in a sudden instinctive mood to ward off the blow, but I wasn't fast enough. When I came to, I was lying in my cabin. The ship's doctor was there. So was Hernando. So was Anne Grant. Well, I'm sure you will be all right, Mr. Grant. Quite a bump, but if you take it easy... You're not comfortable. Let me loosen your collar here. I wouldn't worry that much about me, Mrs. Grant. One of the crew was stowing some gear in a lifeboat. It slipped out of his hands just as you were passing by. Careless of him, wasn't it? <laughs> well, I will stop by later, Mr. Grant. Are you sure you're all right? Hadn't you better get back to your packing, Mrs. Grant? Oh, I have plenty of time. Can't I help you? Hernando can give me a hand. I'll see you later. Yes. Yes, of course. An accident? No, no. I wasn't wanted up there, Hernando. What about the galley? Still no trace of the drugs. It's 5.25. I left Mrs. Grant in the lounge 20 minutes ago. She was going to pack. How did she get here? How did she learn about it? I heard some of the passengers mention your accident when I started back from the galley. Suddenly, the news was all over the ship. Look. Oh, look, we're slowing down. That means the pilot is coming aboard. Let's get down to the galley. We all but tore that galley apart. No sign of the opium. The kitchen crew wasn't of much help. Half of them couldn't speak English or didn't want to. And then it dawned on me. That garbage that went over the stern. The fire starting just about that time. Brandstatter wanting to watch the seagulls. I tore back up the companionway from Mrs. Grant's cabin. As I reached the deck, Chupin called to me. Mr. Grant. Oh, Mr. Grant. Huh? Oh, well, what's the trouble, Chupin? There is no trouble now, but when I couldn't find you, I was so afraid. You you just disappeared. I've been all over the ship looking for you. Oh, well, now, isn't that funny? I was just trying to find you. I want you to do something for me, Princess. I, uh... Well, I, I'd... I'd like to talk to Anne. Alone. Just for a few minutes. Uh, you like her, don't you, Mr. Brandt? Yes, yes, I do. Very much. Oh, uh... uh, uh Mr. Brandstad awarded my business address. I won't have time to look for him, so I wrote him a little note. While I'm with Anne, will you take the his cabin? Oh, I'll be glad to. And don't forget, come right back here and wait for me. It was a short note. The seagulls didn't get everything, did they? But it was a nice try. I signed my real name, Barrows. I wanted to be in Mrs. Grant's cabin when Bramstetter read it. Well, hello. Come on in. The cabin's decided. I just I... wanted to tell you I won't be able to have dinner with you and Bramstetter tonight. Oh, that's a shame. Yes, isn't it? So many things I wanted to ask you. Well, we'll all meet in San Francisco. Oh, but some of this can't wait. For instance, uh, about your past life. My past life? And your husband. Yeah. Tell me about him. Just like that? Yes. Quite a love story, wasn't it? Or maybe it wasn't. Not the last year of it, no. Really? You seem so full of his memory in Shanghai. You were going to stay in China to finish his work. His work was something else. Oh, so you approved of that, huh? An engineer believes in building something. The point is, what? We don't at all want to build the same thing. The Japanese high command, for instance, they want to build one kind of world and I want to build another. Meaning what? Meaning your husband, Jerome Grant. Quite a coincidence, this snapshot, my picking it up in Egypt. Where did you get it? Where you played governess for Ben Shah's children. Where your husband was building better irrigation for better poppies. That was his work. Helping to make a billion slaves of the next generation. I just want the answer to one question from you. When you were back at the stern watching the seagulls, the opium went overboard with the garbage, didn't it? Didn't it? And if that's your pal, then I'll know for sure. Shall I answer it? Pick up the phone, just say one word, hello, and then give it to me. Hello? This is Grant. This is Chopin. It's Chopin. Give it to me. Chopin? I, I just couldn't wait, Mr. Grant. What did she say? Oh, everything's going fine, Princess. You just wait right there, huh? That wasn't the one, Mrs. Grant. Senor Barro, Senor Barro. Come in, Hernando. You'd better come, Senor. Stay here, Hernando. Watch her. He's coming, Senor. Hurry. Suicide. The third fanatic who paid for failure. But Bramstetter's death told me many things I wanted to know. While the ship's captain was fixing the approximate spot where the opium had been thrown overboard, I was talking by radio to the Coast Guard. 
I asked for boats to meet the Cardillo as fast as they could get to us. Here's a chart of where the stuff went overboard, Mr. Barrows. Within half a mile, anyway. A million dollars in opium at the bottom of the ocean. But not for long, Captain. This stunt isn't exactly new. The opium will be in waterproof wrappings and attached to floats. They'll be anchored on ropes, chemically treated. The salt water will gradually eat away the ropes, and the floats will bring the drugs to the surface. And you'll be there to pick it up. Yeah, unless somebody else beats us to it. I'd better stand by, Mr. Barrows. Those launches will be alongside in no time. They sent three launches. I took Anne Grant with me and Chupin. She wouldn't be separated from us, or I let her have a way. It was 10 or 12 miles back to the spot, and the question was... Would we make it in time? The ropes might have broken already. The stuff picked up. And the rest of the Gene Hawks... Waterboard ahead, Mr. Barrows. They're fishing something up out of the water. Well, don't let them get away. I want them alive. But if you've got to shoot... Sounds like they're starting us, sir. Watch it, ladies. Here we go. It was our three boats against their one. They might have made a run for it, but they tried to save the opium. A few minutes later, they surrendered. But these were workmen, not leaders. Where was Gene Hawks? I looked at the girl in my launch, and I had the answer. The prisoners went aboard the other boats. I took the narcotics, and with Mrs. Grant and Chupin, we cut away from the others and headed directly for customs. There were two Coast Guardsmen handling the launch. Their backs were to us when suddenly... Chupin! No! Get back! What's the idea, Princess? Put the gun down. Tell him to make for a point a mile above Conover Beacon. She grabbed his gun. That famous gun. Did you hear what I said? Better head for shore, boys. A mile above Conover Beacon. That's an order, sir. That's an order. Never heard of Gene Hawks, Mrs. Grant? Gene Hawks? The name that took those narcotics around the world? Never heard of it, huh? No. Amazing. Could be our baby-faced princess here. I am 20 years old. The Chinese girl for the honor and glory of Japan. Tell him to go faster. The lady says to speed up, Skipper. Well, what are you going to do? Get the stuff ashore, then what? You'll have to kill the four of us, won't you? But well, that's insane, is it? Gene Hawks would do it without batting an eye. And you had no idea, Mrs. Grant. No. Didn't even know your husband was hired by Japan to grow narcotics. And that you've been chaperoning Gene Hawks ever since Pan Yen. You, the respectable widow of an American killed by Japanese bombs. Didn't know that, huh? No. Or maybe that isn't how he died at all. Maybe he knew too much and wasn't the fanatic he should have been. He wasn't. Wife, you murdered him. No, you did. With notions of helping China and asking questions, he was told to get rid of you. But he couldn't bring himself to do it, huh? Still had a little feeling for his wife. That weakness licked him, didn't it? Ah, that's the weakness that licked me, too. The feeling I had for a helpless little girl. Oh, I was a sucker for that, wasn't I? Your side prays in that kind of thing. Decent human feeling. No use for it yourself except to fake it. But I've been learning fast, Princess, and I learned that lesson just in time. In fact, I had an idea who you were when you got in this boat. Stop lying. You see, after the accident, Mrs. Grant was standing by my bed. But not the warm little girl who liked me so much. Where was she? At the stern, watching seagulls. She must have heard about it the same time Mrs. Grant did. What made her so late in coming to find me? And how those lines of suffering in an artist's sketch of a young girl could be the madness of a grown woman. But I wasn't sure yet. So the next step was that note to Branstetter. When he didn't call Mrs. Grant, when he killed himself... That could mean you opened the note on the way, told Ramstad that he'd failed and that his services were no longer required. See what I mean, Princess? You can't fake real feelings, not for long. They're the exclusive property of real human beings. Now put on that gun. Come and take it, Mr. Brent. Yes. Yes, I will. No, don't. She'll kill you. She'll kill you. Keep pulling the trigger, Princess. Not loaded. Oh, what a shame. What do you know, Mr. Burroughs? Your stunt worked. Yeah, what do you know? Poor little Jean Hawks. Not even one bullet left to kill herself with. Tire up, boys. That's how and where the trail ended. In outer New York Harbor off Conover Beacon. And that's where another trail began, you might say. Because now, back in Frisco, I don't have to worry about my roses getting watered. And does it? like any normal life should. 
All in all, it's like my boss Anslinger said today at Lake Success at a meeting of the World's Narcotic Commission of the United Nations. By this time, I hope we have learned the deeper lesson that no boundaries between people are as important as the simple, common, lasting bond of belonging to the human race. Before our stars return for their curtain calls, here's a sensational bargain for homemakers. The amazing new Regal Aluminum Saucepan. A guaranteed $2 value, now only $1 in the famous Lever Brothers Company Buy Two sale. It's the biggest improvement in saucepans in years. Just listen to this. You can drain hot water from food without removing the cover. Just shift the position of the cover and pour off the liquid through tiny holes in the side of the pan. You can't scald your hands or spill food. An indicator tells you at a glance the proper position of the cover for cooking or draining. This self-drained saucepan is a full two-quart size and made of gleaming heavy-gauge aluminum. The Bakelite handle resists heat and won't twist or turn. What a value. Only one dollar in Lever Brothers Company buy two sale if you order it right away. Here's all you do. Buy two boxes of Lux Flakes. Get a free order blank at your store or... Send your name and address and the tops from two boxes of Lux Flakes plus one dollar to Lever Homemakers Club, Box 27, New York 8, New York. That's Lever Homemakers Club, Box 27, New York 8, New York. You'll receive your saucepan promptly and postpaid, but hurry. This offer expires July 1st and is good only in the United States, Alaska, and Hawaii. Here's Mr. Keeley with our stars. After covering a good part of the world in tonight's play, here are Dick Powell and Signe Hassel back for the curtain call they certainly earned. Thanks a lot, Bill. I'd like to thank Signe for postponing her New York trip so she could be with us tonight. Are you vacationing on Broadway, Signe? No, nothing like that, Mr. Keeley. I'm going east to rehearse for the play Love for a Stranger, and then I'm going to tour in summer stock with it. Mm, then I guess you'll be traveling most of the summer. Yes, and I packed my trunks this morning. And I think you may be interested to know that one thing I always put in is an emergency supply of Lux Flakes. I wouldn't be without them. Well, good luck with your tour. Dick, I hear you've joined the Northwest Royal Mounted Police for your newest picture. That's right, Bill. This is our second production with our own company. The story is the bestseller Mrs. Mike, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And who plays Mrs. Mike? Well, Evelyn Keyes, and she's doing a wonderful job. Any location trips? Oh, we had one trip to Sun Valley. Uh, it's been so cold here lately, though, we could have shot it in Hollywood Boulevard. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, we'll go to the High Sierras for summer scenes. Uh, what play are you produ producing here next week, Mr. Keeley? One of the most unusual dramas the screen has given us in recent years is the 20th century Fox hit, Anna and the King of Siam. And repeating one of her greatest screen performances, we'll have Irene Dunn. Her co-star, a fine artist you've all been waiting to hear, James Mason. I know everyone in this audience will be back next week to hear the exciting story of Anna and the King of Siam. You'll have another hit, Bill. Good night. Good night. Good night and thank you. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, Join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Irene Dunn and James Mason in Anna and the King of Siam. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett and our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Anna and the King of Siam, starring Irene Dunn and James Mason. The generous new bath size Lux Toilet Soap is making a hit with screen stars, with lovely women everywhere. Try this big satin smooth cake. You'll enjoy its abundant creamy lather, the delicate flower-like fragrance it leaves on your skin. The new bath size Lux Toilet Soap is another fine product of Lever Brothers Company. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Anna and the King of Siam, starring Irene Dunn and James Mason. 
Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows over these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.